The horrors of the Gulag are well known, but Gulags weren't necessarily the worst place you could end up getting sent to in the Soviet Union. Nazino Island, also known as Cannibal Island, was one of the worst Soviet atrocities that most people haven't heard of. What happened on Nazino Island, and why did things get so bad? In this episode of Intrigued Mind, we'll be looking at the four settlements of the USSR. While Joseph Stalin was still the head of the Soviet Union, he sent many people into what was known as internal exile. They weren't exiled from the country, but they were sent to locations known as four settlements all across Siberia. They were deported to uninhabited land in the frozen tundra for political reasons generally, and sometimes just to free up more space in the prisons and the gulags. On paper, these four settlements sounded a lot better than a gulag. You could live with your family there, you could move around the settlement relatively freely, and there weren't the same restrictions as there were in the forced labor camps. However, ending up in a forced settlement meant you were a second-class citizen, and your level of freedom within the Soviet Union had just dropped down another notch. They were not allowed to return to where they came from, and the conditions in these four settlements was often brutal. The Siberian taiga made sure that surviving was not easy. The most infamous forced settlement in Soviet history was Nazino Island. Nazino Island was a deserted river island in northwestern Siberia. It was extremely cold and almost totally isolated from the rest of society. The deportees were doomed as soon as they were dropped off by the government. In just 13 weeks, Nazino Island collapsed into chaos so completely that it became known as Death Island and Cannibal Island. So why exactly did the Soviet Union create four settlements in the first place? Before we dive into that, if you're interested in early access to videos and live chats with the creator of Intrigued Mind, consider subscribing to our Patreon. Your support will greatly help us keep the channel producing more intriguing content. In 1933, the head of the Gulag system and the head of the secret police proposed the idea to Stalin. They wanted to deport 2 million people to Siberia so that they could turn some of the massive amounts of land in Siberia into self-sufficient productive towns. Since nobody in their right mind wanted to move out there, the communists would just force people to move out there. They predicted that in just a couple of years, the area would be a functioning part of the Soviet Union. The plan was based on something called dekulakization that had gone on a few years prior. A kulak was a peasant who had enough money to own his own farmland and hire workers. The Soviet Union collectivized the kulak's farms and shipped them off to remote areas of Siberia. These kulak deportees actually managed to become self-sufficient up there, and the program was considered a success. The four settlements would be modeled off of this, but with disastrous results. Stalin approved of the forced settlement plan, despite the fact that there was a huge famine in the Russian countryside at the time, severely limiting supplies. There were other settlements before Nazino, but not many after. Nazino Island is in the middle of the Ob River, about 500 miles north of the city of Tomsk. Most of the people who got sent there were from urban areas like Moscow and Leningrad, and had no real experience with farming or living in the tundra. The island is tiny, it's slightly less than 2 miles long and only 660 yards wide, it's a swampy, desolate piece of land located in an area of western Siberia that is barely populated at all. The only people who live anywhere nearby are a few groups of indigenous Ostyak people. Many of those sent off to Nazino were criminals who the government wanted shipped off as far away from the rest of society as possible. Just getting to Nazino was dangerous. By the time the first group of deportees arrived on the island, some people had already died in transit, and many were so exhausted from the brutal journey that they couldn't even stand. The second wave of deportees came with 20 tons of flour, courtesy of the Soviet government. The island's residents were so hungry that fighting broke out immediately. Guards had to shoot at the prisoners to keep them away from the flour. In order to try and prevent riots over food, the guards delegated prisoners to deliver the flour rations out to the different parts of the island. This caused a lot of the flour to just get hoarded or stolen. The guards were losing their grip on the island fast. Food wasn't the only issue on the island. The roughly 6,000 deportees had been dropped off simply with whatever they happened to be wearing when they had been arrested. They weren't given tools or building materials, meaning they had little to no shelter. Anyone who tried to escape by swimming across the frigid Ob River would be shot by the guards on the other side, if they managed to cross the freezing waters. Unlike the Kulaks from Stalin's earlier deportation experiments, these people knew nothing about the basic farming they were supposed to be doing. They had no real idea how to clear the land, cultivate the island, and turn the place into some kind of hospitable little town. Instead of doing any of that, criminals formed gangs in order to terrorize the other settlers. The small amount of flour that some people managed to get their hands on couldn't be baked into anything because they didn't have any ovens. The Soviets weren't exactly known for their excellent planning abilities. Instead, the people mixed the flour with water from the river in order to make a sort of paste that could be eaten. 
This meant that they were essentially drinking a lot of water straight from the river, and a lot of people on Azino got dysentery. Other diseases, like typhus, began to spread as well. If you didn't get a horrible disease, there was a danger of being killed by a guard or one of your fellow inmates. Murder was commonplace, as people fought over the limited food supplies. Dead bodies containing gold teeth, fillings, and crowns were also fought over. Even if you could avoid getting murdered or getting some disease, your problems were far from over. People on Nizino died of starvation, hypothermia, exposure, and exhaustion. Even Stalin had to accept that the plan had been a complete failure, and so he shut it down. But it took a month to travel to Nizino and let them know that their overlords had decided to cancel their little settlement. During that month, things only got worse. People resorted to cannibalism quickly because there was just nothing else to eat. A girl, who was 13 at the time and survived, later spoke about the cannibalism she had seen. She reported seeing one of the guard's girlfriends get murdered and eaten, saying, People grabbed the girl, tied her to a tree, and stabbed her to death, eating everything they could. They were hungry and wanted to eat. All over the island, one could see human flesh being ripped, cut, and hung on trees. The clearings were littered with corpses. A woman living in a village nearby spoke about her encounter with one of the survivors of Nazino Island. Once, an old woman came from the Death Island. I saw that the old woman's calves had been chopped off. When I asked her, she said, they were cut off on Death Island and grilled. All the flesh on her calves had been cut off. Other people on Nazino Island were more restrained with their cannibalism. They would only eat people who they thought were on the brink of death. This was seen as being sort of merciful, since their suffering would be cut short and they could just die a little early. Even after Nazino Island was shut down, things didn't get all that much better for the deportees. They weren't allowed to go back to where they had come from. They were sent off to other Siberian camps and gulags, where many of them ended up starving to death or dying of exposure anyway. We wouldn't know about Nazino Island today if it wasn't for a man named Vasily Valichko. Valichko was a member of the Nerim District Committee of the Communist Party and was sent to a forced settlement so that he could report on how great everything was going. Instead, he heard horror stories about Nazino Island from survivors. And so, he ended up investigating what actually happened instead of writing a Soviet propaganda piece. Because of Velichko's report, the Kremlin created a special commission to look into Nizino Island. They found mass graves on the island and realized that of the 6,000 people who had been sent to Nizino, 4,000 were either dead or missing. In the late 1980s, just before the collapse of the Soviet Union, the public at large finally learned about Nizino Island. Mikhail Gorbachev's glasnost policy, which supported openness and government transparency, meant that people outside the government could finally read Velichko's report on Nazino. This particularly dark Soviet atrocity finally became known to the whole country. Every year, people from the nearby towns will cross the Ob River to place a wreath on the island in memory of those who died there in 1933. For more videos on the most amazing forgotten parts of our history, be sure to subscribe to the Intrigued Mind channel, like the video, and leave your suggestions in the comments below.